All right. So welcome, everybody. We have Ms. Cora Hume from Consumer Financial Protection Bureau here with us today. Um, Ms. Hume is an attorney with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau Office of Older Americans. She joined the Bureau in 2012. Prior to joining Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Ms. Hume was a legislative director at the National Association of Consumer Advocates, a membership organization of consumer protection attorneys. Ms. Hume has over 20 years of advocacy and legal experience in consumer protection, elder, voting rights, labor, and fair housing law. She started her legal career at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, um, <clears throat> in the Fair Housing Division. She's a graduate of Williams College and Northeastern University School of Law. Um, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Ms. Hume. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to um, pop them in the chat, and she will answer them um, when she has a second. Thank you. Welcome, Great. Cora. Great, thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I have to start by um, doing a disclaimer that we're required to do, and it just says um, that these, uh, let me advance my slides there, that this presentation is my own opinions, it doesn't represent the Bureau, and it's part of a live discussion. So check that box off. And I just wanted to go over what, uh, our agenda today. So we're going to talk about just really briefly who I, uh, the CFPB is, uh, what uh, the Office for Older Americans does. Then I'm going to talk about uh, trends in older adult home ownership, but also uh, more so for this audience, um, trends in aging in place. Um, I've put a lot of thought into how to make this presentation applicable uh, to renters uh, and your clients. Um, so I'm going to talk about that uh, um, and try to focus on where it would be relevant. Um, I'm going to talk about the development of our housing decision guides and then provide a little color on each of those guides. So about the CFBB, um, we're a federal agency created after the financial crisis. Um, we make sure that banks and lenders treat consumers fairly. And we implement and enforce uh, federal consumer financial laws. And we make sure that the market works for consumers and that the products are fair, transparent, and competitive. Um, so the Office for Older Mayor, oh, sorry, the CFPB's core functions, as you can see on this um, slide, is we identify trends. Um, we want to uh, root out unfair and deceptive or abusive acts and practices by writing rules. Uh, we supervise companies, so we go in and look at their books. We enforce the laws, so we do uh, lit we litigate against bad actors. And then we also take consumer complaints, um, so consumers can get responses from uh, the financial institution. Uh, we monitor those complaints to look for trends. Um, we do financial education uh, to consumers to help them uh, know their rights and to empower them uh, to make good decisions um, on the products that, that they feel uh, is useful to them. Now, my office, the Older Americans, it was created under the legislation that created um, the Bureau. Um, so there is a mandate that my office exists. It's for um, we address issues of persons 62 and older, but we also talk about and look at things that affect families and also those who will be aging into 62 and older. So it goes beyond the 62 and older. And our goal is to protect consumers from financial harm and help, excuse me, them navigate key financial moments as they grow older. Okay, so as I said, I put um, some thought into, you know, I've been wrestling with how to make this a presentation relevant to you and your clients. And what I, what I, where I came down was that these housing decision guides were originally made for those who, um, older adults who own their homes and help them navigate what to do with their equity as they age in place. Understanding who your audience is as renters, um, these guides, um, some of them are still very applicable. Um, and so, uh, we're going to highlight that, but also, you know, 
just like me, um, you know, people who are um, older adult homeowners, uh, my parents um, being one of them, and they're aging in place right now. So not only do these guides apply to your family, uh, to your clients, but also to your family and friends. So um, hopefully you'll be relevant uh, to both. So deciding to age in place, uh, what does that mean? Um, it means that people want to stay out of institutional care so they can remain in their home, whether they own that home or not. Um, they might decide to downsize into something smaller, but still be out of institutional care. Um, and so aging in place, as you can see, a large majority of those 65 and older want to age in place. Um, and I think this is even um, more profound after COVID. Uh, people are deciding to age in place instead of going into congregate care settings. Um, but aging in place is a is a complicated issue, um, in part because it goes it touches on emotional uh, aspects of decision making, physical and and financial. Um, so, despite the desire to age in place, there are other influences uh, that might affect the decision making. So one of them I touched on is um, physical, right? That the homes have to be uh, a place where someone can age in place. Um, and, um, you know, whether they can get around in their home, uh, can they get into the bathroom? Can they get up steps? And as you can see here, I pulled some data um, from the Joint Center for Housing Studies out of Harvard about uh, uh, aging in place and mobility. So as you can see, 72 million renters were headed by persons aged 65 and over. Um, that number is expected to soar by 2039. And then, um, you know, uh, the percentage of those persons um, who are have reported having difficulty um, moving around from room to room or um, moving around their house. So there are people who want to make their homes more accessible. And then there are those who are sort of trapped in their homes because they can't afford to move, right? Moving costs are high, uh, they can't afford nursing home care. So there are also uh, clients like that um, who wanna find a more accessible uh, unit, but can't afford to do so. And then there's also the question of availability too, as you know, um, there is a limited number of accessible units. Um, and so uh, despite the desire to find something accessible, it might be difficult. There's also the cost burden um, in terms of aging in place. Um, so as I mentioned, the availability of homes, um, but also uh, how do you pay for care, right? As we age in place, our needs change. And um, how how is someone going to get those needs met, whether it's help getting medicine, taking their medicine or cooking or cleaning? Um, where does that support come from? So is it going to be self-financed? Uh, which in many of your clients' situation, they don't have those funds to self-finance like through long-term care insurance. Um, or is it going to be a family caregiver, which also puts a financial strain um, on the family if it's a family member uh, or um, because that caregiver might uh, give up working part-time or full-time to care for the older adult who wants to age in place. So, um, and, and this cost burden also makes people more vulnerable. So as you can see on this slide, on the right hand side, that's where it's over um, regarding adults over uh, 65. Uh, so we see the strain in terms of aging in place um, on, on food um, and healthcare, the high cost of uh, renting. Okay, so with that in mind, um, again, our, our this was originally intended for, um, for older homeowners since over 90% of older adults um, eight, uh, own their homes. But um, to go into how we kind of started this, we started in 2019, so it's been a process. And we looked first at 150 resources on um, older adults and aging in place and homes, owning their homes. And we looked to try to identify gaps as well as you know strengths of these tools. We didn't want to recreate the wheel. Um, so, and then we did interviews, um, and the goal of these interviews, um, were to learn about how housing decisions are made by older homeowners, um, and what process they go through to make these decisions. 
What kind of information do they use? And where do they get that information? So we interviewed both older adult homeowners, but also their family members and intermediaries um, about this decision-making process. And we found um, that um, not a lot of older adults have a plan uh, for their housing as they age. Um, and so many of them can be caught off guard uh, by sudden developments in health or death of a spouse. And this, this lack of planning also opens up uh, older adults to fraud and scams. Um, as you know, when in a crisis situation, um, people are looking, are desperate. Um, and so um, they're preyed upon by fraudsters and scammers. Um, and so planning really can help prevent fraud and scams. Um, so we wanted to divide, design materials that assisted older adults in thinking about um, their housing decisions. So um, to do that, we created uh, a couple of personas. Um, and these personas were based off uh, interviews of people that we saw in those interviews, uh, the common themes that came out of those interviews. And these personas then help guide our work in terms of content. Um, so I just want to highlight the personas we used. And some of them you probably recognize in your own client, clients, and some of them you, you might not. But we started with uh, Never Thought About It, Norman. Um, and many participants fell into this category. Um, they didn't have a ready response for how they were going to age in place, how they were going to use their equity in their home. And they just really hadn't thought about it. Um, and I, I want to emphasize that this um, thought bubble that's blank doesn't mean that Norman isn't thoughtful about a lot of other things. He just hasn't thought about his household finances. So what, is, what does Norman need? What does he want? Um, he really doesn't want much because he hasn't been looking for information. But what he needs is information about his options and how to prepare for a crisis affecting his housing. Um, the second persona we looked at was age in place Anne. Uh, she assumes that she'll be um, in her home until she dies. For those that own their home, she really wants, uh, you know, Anne owns her home in this instance. She wants to pass it down to her children or her heirs. Um, owning a home is uh, important to her. She takes pride in it. And she's not going to use that home uh, as a safety net to draw out equity. Um, she wants to just be there and then die and pass it on. So what does Anne need and what does she want? Um, the, she wants to have information on ways to lower her housing costs so she can stay in her home. Uh, she wants information about uh, her options to pay for physical modification. And she, again, needs, um, just like Norman, uh, information on how to prepare for a crisis. So although your clients might not own their home, um, those scenarios are very applicable in terms of lowering housing costs to stay in the home and options for paying for um, physical modifications, as well as preparing for the cr uh, a crisis as it arises. Then we have Help Me Harvey. Um, he is imminently facing uh, a, a challenge, whether that's uh, a health crisis, a loss of a job, an unexpected expense that leads to financial strain. Harvey is facing that head on. Um, and he's he's not really looking for help. In fact, he's just putting his head in the sand. In the, in the sand. He's pretending it's not there. Um, I was uh, uh, previously a legal aid attorney in Maryland. I had clients who would bring in bags of unopened mail, um, so they didn't really know what their situation was because uh, they just refused to acknowledge that they needed help. Um, so that's Harvey. Um, and what does Harvey need? Um, Harvey needs a fair amount, right? Um, so um, he needs to learn immediately what his options are. Um, and he needs to know where to go to find trustworthy and reliable information. He's very vulnerable to exploitation. Again, because he's in a crisis situation, he's going to be desperate um, and is going to look for solutions that might not, uh, might be approached for solutions that might not be the best fit for him. And then we've got, uh, I've got people, Irene. We, we all know someone who has their act together you thought things through. Irene is fully on top of things. 
Um, she's obtained reliable information from friends or family or professionals. Um, and so she, she feels on top of it. She really knows where she's heading in terms of her housing as she ages. Um, she still has wants and needs though. Um, you know, she wants some confirmation that she has the right answers and, you know, um, and that she's gotten the, her answers from a reliable source. Um, and, you know, I think she's still open to learning more about the big picture of all her options. So those are the four personas that we we develop these guides for with them in mind um, and to, to address their needs and wants. So these are the four guides we came up with, um, and they're not just for older adults um, and they're not just for homeowners. So the four guides are loss of a spouse or partner. Uh, number two was how to navigate uh, a change in health. Uh, three was how to leave your home to your children or heirs. That is particular to a homeowner. And then um, those who own their home, how to use the home equity to meet financial needs. And we see these guides as just-in-time resources, really to meet the older adult where they are at in their situation. Um, we... <laughs> developed content using um, some national experts on aging and consumer protection. And then after that content, we user tested it. So these uh, we tested the content to make sure that older adults um, understood the content and that it was in um, a, a, a text uh, that they, they could comprehend. Um, we have it in English and it's being translated into eight additional languages, which will be available on our website within the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, the guides are available for download. So when you have a client who comes in your door and one of these guides would be applicable, um, you can just download it, print it out and hand it to them. Um, you can also have them uh, ordered in print and bulk um, for free. So as a legal services attorney, I would have had these on my resource bookshelf out in the waiting room. So I would have been one of those people who would have loved free, free um, materials, resources for my clients. And now we also have an opportunity to co-brand. Um, this will be available in the next couple of weeks. But if your um, organization or if you're working for a nonprofit, um, you can put on your organization's um, brand as well. And so as trusted uh, members of your community, co-branding is always a great option. So I'm going to just dive briefly <coughs> excuse me, into each of the guides just so you know what's in them. And then um, I'll open it up for conversation. Um, and if we don't fill the time, that, that's fine. Um, so the first one is losing a house or uh, losing a spouse or partner. Um, again, this that isn't a situation that only applies to older adults, uh, but it is more common as as people age to to lose their partner. So this guide uh, helps them consider their options um, and whether to stay in the home uh, and whether that makes sense. And we broke it down uh, in terms of whether it makes sense emotionally, physically, and financially in this guide, uh, recognizing that all three play into this decision making. So the guide provides prop questions that help raise issues that help uh, this older adult navigate what what's the best fit for them. Um, so, you know, one of our goals was really to provide big pictures so that they could then make a decision based on their individual um, circumstances. So, for example, a prompt in terms of emotional decision making, does staying in the home bring fond memories or does it create a greater feeling of loss, right? Um, will moving make it easier to or harder to see family and friends? Um, these are emotional decisions that an older adult needs to consider. Um, and then there's the physical, as we've talked about. Um, but these prompts are, for example, was my spouse uh, my caregiver? Um, and how I, if so, how how am I going to get the need, the care I need? Um, did the spouse maintain the home and the yard? Is that something I could do on my own? Um, is it hard to go up, up the stairs or maneuver in the hallways or to get into the bathroom or take a shower? Um, does that, is this more challenging um, now that my spouse is gone? Um, and then, for example, 
do I have trouble running errands, managing meds, cooking in the kitchen, right? Those are all things that might change. Um, and then we had prompts for financial. Um, usually a loss of a partner or spouse means an in uh, income loss, right? So does that create a strain on the older adult? Uh, what happens if I can't afford the home? Another concern. And so uh, the guide provides prompts and then it also talk, has at the end, um, as all the guides do, uh, resources that can help the older adult. So government resources, but also nonprofit. Um, and so for example, um, budgeting help, how to get help in terms of modifying the home. We always have a referral um, in the end to a HUD certified housing counselor. So where they can get uh, additional uh, help in terms of talking to someone or where they might look to get, for example, money to modify the home. Um, so that's, that's the um, spouse loss of a spouse or partner guide. We then did also um, housing decisions when your health changes. Again, not limited to older adults, but more prevalent among older adults. And this guide really helps them consider their housing options uh, given what they're currently going through uh, with a medical crisis or they're facing an imminent uh, medical uh, change in healthcare. So this provides a checklist to help homeowners think through their needs after their change in the health. So not just medical needs, we talk about medical needs in terms of distribution of medicine or wound care, um, but then also non-medical care um, in terms of our, our daily living needs, showering, cooking, um, getting in and out of bed. So we talk about, there's a chart in terms of um, sort of a checklist that goes through both the medical and the non-medical needs. And then we talk about the options that people have in terms of um, that might be something more suitable for them based on their medical and non-medical needs. So can they move in with family? Um, is that an option? Should they move into assisted living? What does that mean to move into assisted living and what kind of care can assisted living provide? Um, it, for those that have a lot of money and uh, own their home, moving into a continuing care retirement community might be an option. Um, they're expensive, but it helps. Uh, it, it provides full suite of services as the needs increase. And then what does it mean to do, move into a nursing home? What kind of assistance do nursing homes provide? Um, and so again, it provides a big picture so people can see all their options before making a decision that's right for them. Um, we saw when we did the resource scan was there's a lot of resources out there that are very specific to one type of product or one type of need, but there's nothing really out there that shows the big picture. So that way someone knows all their options before choosing which one fits best for them. So those are probably the two guides that are most relevant for your clients. Um, but I just wanna to touch on the other two in part because again, these are relevant to all of our lives as we have uh, loved ones and the people we care for who are aging in their homes uh, and might own their home. So a lot of older adults who own their homes wanna leave their homes to their children or their heirs. Um, and this obviously has a lot of uh, legal and tax implications. And so we very much highlight that it's important to talk to a professional with expertise in both um, because they can have um, really long-term ramifications uh, and so best to make sure you're choosing what makes sense legally and tax wise. So the timing of when you sell or gift your home or leave your home um, obviously can affect your med Medicaid ed eligibility. So that's something that we flag in this guide. Um, we also flag, you know, talking to your children or heirs on what they're going to do with the home when you, once you leave it to them. Um, obviously it's theirs once you give it to them. Um, and, you know, what they might do with it might affect your decision on how you want to leave it to them. For example, if they're planning to sell the home, um, your choice of how to leave it to them could really potentially save them thousands of dollars in taxes. So again, gathering information um, is important. And as you can see on this slide, we talk about uh, how to leave the home, whether it's through a will, uh, giving it as a gift, uh, selling it is an option, um, 
and we flag that once you give it or sell it, it is no longer yours. So there really needs to be a plan of what happens. Uh, where, where are you going? Um, you will no longer be a decision maker on that home. Um, placing your, the home in a trust and in a limited um, number of states, <clears throat> there's also a transfer on death deed that's similar to leaving in a trust. Uh, but we wanted to just put that in there because it is an option in some states. And then lastly, we did a guide on how the home can be used to meet financial needs. So there's a lot of baby boomers, as you know, who are aging that don't have a pension, um, who have retirement shortfalls, and the home can really be a safety net. Um, and um, some of them will use their home to help uh, them manage uh, to pay for expenses in retirement. So we discussed four options, cash out refinance, a home equity loan, a home equity line of credit, and a reverse mortgage. And then as you can see here, we go into uh, in a chart and then take a deeper dive in terms of the eligibility for all of these four options, um, how the homeowner can receive the money when they have, um, use one of these options, whether their monthly payments, um, based on these four options, and then what happens to the loan balance over time. Um, so uh, again, providing a big picture of options, uh, so that way the older adult can make a decision that's best for them. So for example, as a legal aid attorney, um, sometimes I use reverse mortgages um, to help save a home from foreclosure. But in other instances, a reverse mortgage doesn't make sense if the older adult main goal is to leave their home to their heir. Uh, reverse mortgages uh, are an expensive product and um, the loan balance grows over time um, as the equity decreases. So again, understanding these options can help make an older adult um, decision uh, best suited for them and, and helps them understand it. And of course, we have a lot of resources on reverse mortgages uh, if you're older adult uh, that you know uh, is interested in that. So where to find the housing decision guides? Um, we have a vanity URL, uh, consumerfinance.gov housing decisions. Uh, we will circulate this slide deck, I think, and there's the um, QR code if you want to use your phone to lead you to the housing decision. Again, they can be downloaded and you can order them in bulk. And then I just wanted to close out with um, you know where you can find us. Um, you are always welcome to email us at the Older Americans inbox. We'll get back to you uh, if you have any questions um, or you know we really welcome ideas on how we can help you um, best serve your clients. Um, so if you have a great idea in the middle of the night and wanna email us, that, that's the place to go. Um, we have our website where you can find all our resources um, at older, uh, consumerfinance.gov forward slash older Americans. And then, as I mentioned, there's a special URL to lead you to the reverse mortgage page if that's something you want to get some resources on, both for those interested in reverse mortgages and those who have reverse mortgages. We have guides on uh, for both audiences. The complaint system, um, if your clients or you or your family members or someone in your community has an issue with a financial institution, for example, auto, credit card, or banking, um, money transfer. There's we have a long list of um, of issues within our jurisdiction. Uh, you can file a complaint, and the company we forward that complaint to the company. They're required to respond within a matter of days. And you know, um, having information about what's going on is pretty key in terms of finding a solution. Uh, we don't handle individual complaints in terms of resolution. We monitor them for uh, trends, but they really do inform all of our work at the Bureau in terms of enforcement, supervision, and, and education, and, and um, market monitoring. But it also empowers you because it gets you information or your clients information, uh, especially when they're getting the runaround. And then lastly, um, the Ask CFPB. Um, I use all the time. Um, so if you have a question uh, on a financial product or service, um, you know, it's a great place to start. Um, 
And usually it's a place where I start to learn about something that uh, that I might not know. So um, there is a huge amount of Q&A in the Ask the OCD. So I encourage you uh, to use that um, when you want. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm also, you know, happy to answer questions um, via email if you want some time to look at the guides. Um, so, but I really appreciate you joining today. I think this could be a really useful resource for some of your clients. And then again, for people in your community or your family that might be navigating this space. Thank you, Cora. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can either unmute yourselves or drop them in the chat. Um, I did get a direct question from one of our participants asking about the guides and um, would they be available to them, but you've already answered that. Um, if there's any resources that you want to send to me, I can email them out after the session is over along with the slide deck. So just send those over to me. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the participants on the call? Uh, may I ask you a question, please? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Olga Dubbins, um, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, Ms. Cora, could you please give some examples of complaints you receive from your clients? Yeah, so from consumers, I mean, <laughs> Olga, it's going to be, you know, the sky's the limit. So, um, Let's see, I work a lot in housing, so um, there are complaints that I was reading on zombie second mortgages where uh, the consumer has a second uh, uh, mortgage out. That mortgage has gone silent for years. Um, they think it's been written off or it has been charged off through bankruptcy, and then a debt buyer buys it and um, tries to foreclose on their home. Um, I was reading complaints yesterday about um, junk fees that are attacked on to renters in terms of uh, courtesy fees for breaking your lease and, and several thousands of dollars we're talking about. Um, so um, I was reading complaints on courtesy fees. Uh, we read a lot of complaints about credit reporting, uh, incorrect uh, credit reporting uh, issues. Uh, debt collection, ID theft, um, auto loans, uh, money transfers again, uh, in terms of maybe issues uh, there, um, access to banking. Um, you know, there are benefit cards where people um, um, complain that there's been fraud and then they're not getting uh, provisional credit on to get access to their benefits until that fraud is um, investigated and resolved or they're just losing money uh, and they're never reimbursed for that fraud. Um, I'm trying to think what other issues. Um, payday loans, prepaid cards. Uh, so, uh, and actually you can look at our complaint database. Um, it's online if you go to the CFPB. Uh, and so you can just peruse them and search them as well um, by financial institution or by product area. Um, and on our website, um, where it shows uh, the complaint portal, um, there's a video of how to file a complaint. Um, and if you're filing on behalf of your clients, I just want to flag that you need to make sure that you um, have a uh, written agreement from the client, that you can represent them, and that the financial institution can talk to you. So not only in terms of filing the complaint, but you don't want to kick back from the financial institution saying, unauthorized person, we have no idea who Ms. Dobbins is. So client would really have to say to the financial institution, I authorize you to talk to Ms. Dobbins who's representing me. Uh, so make sure that if you are filing a complaint uh, that that happens, otherwise the complaint will just be closed without a response, which is a good thing because we don't want um, financial institutions talking to people who they don't know, giving out personal information. So you just have to jump through that hoop. Does that answer your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh-huh. I have, have any a question. other question. Go ahead. Yes, I have a question. I have um, a young woman that I'm helping in the community outside of my complex that's in need of a toxic mold attorney in Michigan. And she seems to be getting the runaround 
um, mm -hmm. in terms of who she should speak to. Um, mm -hmm. Any thoughts about that? Yeah, I would send her to legal aid. I'd find the local legal aid and get them to do an intake with her. Um, it sounds like if she's getting the runaround, having an attorney uh, representing her could be helpful. I'm sure she meets the income guidelines. Oh, I'm not sure. If she meets the income guidelines, legal aid could represent her. Um, if not, they can also refer her to someone who can help her. Um, is she is she older? Is she an older adult or is she young? Um, she's in her 50s. Okay. You can also, um, so I would start with legal aid first and foremost. Okay. Um, and then the AAA is the Area Agency on Aging is always a great resource uh, in the community. Uh, so they might have some ideas of who can help her. But again, um, I would start with legal aid. That's That sounds like a case that we would have handled um, in Maryland. So I'm sure it's similar in Michigan. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we have one question in the chat. Um, in what circumstance would you recommend a reverse mortgage? Yeah, so it's it's so individually specific. Um, the Bureau, um, so I work on reverse mortgages. The Bureau doesn't really um, provide an opinion on whether we think the product is good or bad. I think it really de depends on the individuals. Um, so like I said, they are an expensive way to borrow money. Um, and the money you borrow, uh, the interest and fees compound every month over time. So um, first and foremost, I just direct you to the reverse mortgage page and to what is a reverse mortgage. Uh, that will walk you through sort of how a reverse mortgage works. Um, but for some older adults, you know, uh, who don't plan on leaving their home to the heirs uh, or have a ton of equity uh, and want to have a line of credit or um, use, use the money um, to age in place, it could be a good option. Um, so it really sort of depends again on the facts. Um, what we have seen in complaints though, is that the older adult, despite their mandatory reverse mortgage counseling, a lot of them don't understand what the product is. And so we see complaints being like, how is my balance this big? Um, or why can't I leave my home to my heirs? Um, and reverse mortgages don't prevent you leaving your home to your heirs. It's just the loan has to be paid back before you leave the home to your heirs. And because it's so expensive and compound grows over time, a lot of people can't pay off that loan um, in order for them to um, keep the home. Um, so I would start with the reverse mortgage. Um, what is a reverse mortgage guide? Uh, and then there's a d reverse mortgage discussion guide, which also goes in depth about the ongoing obligations the reverse mortgage borrower has. So, um, you know, the older adult needs to have money to pay for um, uh, taxes and insurance. Um, often the lender will set aside a chunk of money to make sure that's paid, but that will come out of how much the older adult can receive from a reverse mortgage. Um, so, you know, the, the big benefit of a reverse mortgage is there's no monthly payment, right? So the, the loan doesn't have to be paid back until the older adult leaves the home, um, whether that's through death or moving to a different location. So um, the no monthly payment really opens up um, resources for that older adult to pay for other things. So it does make sense for some people. It's just really understanding the product so that they... Um, can make sure it's the best choice for them. Thank you. And then she had one follow-up question. Um, where should somebody turn to get information on uh, transfer on death um, for a deed of a property? Yeah, so I am not well-versed in that. Um, I would uh, just Google, honestly, whether your state allows a transfer on death deed. Um, and then if that's the case, then I would reach out to a private attorney to help draw that up because um, it's going to be a very state specific matter. Um, where I grew up, that wasn't wasn't an option. Uh, and also, I, I just never had to try to draw up a transfer on death deed. But so I would start by Googling it um, and then you can always reach out to a trust and estates attorney 
uh, which if you want to find a reliable one, you can also look uh, through your state bar association to find um, uh, a, a trust in a state attorney. Thank you. Uh -huh. Does anybody else have any questions? don't see any other ones in the chat and I don't see anybody with their hand raised so I'm going to assume that they do not. Thank you so much Cora. I appreciate your time and all the wonderful information um, and for those of you on the call like I said I will email the uh, slide deck and any additional resources that Cora would like to send over um, via email um, shortly. So thank you all. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.